So, Scott, you should have brought your stress ball to the meeting with you. My cheese squeeze. Your cheese squeeze. It's like yeah. a stress ball, right? Yeah, I got it at the last week's Wisconsin Newspaper Association convention, which was fun. And they gave everybody this little squishy cheese you could squish when you get stressed. And yeah, I could use that at Paul Soglin's endorsement meeting. It was a little intense. I would say <laughs> probably the most contentious meeting I've ever had with a candidate who we agree with on a lot of issues. <laughs> Some of that's just Paul Soglin, but he's definitely taking a aggressive approach toward his opponents. Sachi Rhodes Conway. In the spring, April 2nd, election for Madison mayor. And I guess we'll talk about that today. <laughs> On center stage with Milford and Hands, the Wisconsin State Journal's political podcast from the sensible center of Wisconsin politics. I'm Scott Milford. I'm the editorial page editor for the State Journal. And I'm Phil Hands. I'm the editorial cartoonist for the Wisconsin State Journal. And we are half of the State Journal editorial board. The better looking half. Wisconsin State Journal Editorial Board. We will endorse in the race for mayor this Sunday. Check that out either on Madison.com or in the printed paper, the big thick newspaper, which everybody loves to read. I do. The mayor's race is, I'm sensing it's going to get a little heated here. It's going to get heated. It's going to get intense. Uh, this is the <laughs> biggest race in the ballot for people in Madison, I would argue. And right off the bat, the mayor wanted to stick with the issues. <laughs> we asked him, first of all, like, well, why are you running again? In uh, July, he said he wasn't going to run again for mayor. He was going to kind of retire from politics. And then yeah. later this year, he's like, you know, I am going to run again. And he said it's because Madison needs him to be mayor. You weren't going to run. Now you are running. What? Uh, Madison needs me what as a mayor. You... Elaborate. Well... Because you had the, spoken, you had said the, the, something the, the nice Trump, about the your Trump, opponent. the Trump administration is a real challenge, and I saw that uh, there was a good opportunity that Tony Evers would be elected governor, and so that, along with the immense pressure that I was getting from supporters ranging from community activists to the business community. Uh, led me to change my mind. Biggest theme coming out of this endorsement meeting, at least from his perspective, is he's saying, Satya Rhodes Conway is all talk. I've actually walked. You know, yeah. I've done this. I know what I'm doing. I've done most of the things that she says she wants to do. And he kept referring to her time on city council between 2007 and 2011 as, well, where was she when these were things were going on? <laughs> you know, he kept saying that, which I feel like if you've been mayor in the past and people are talking about longstanding issues, that's not the greatest strategy because we can point to stuff in the 90s where where was Scott, where was Paul Soglin when he was put when, in the 90s when this yeah. issue was going on? Sort of like I always said Confederate Rest. He did this cartoon about Confederate Rest. And, you know, Paul Soglin removed the plaque and, you know, talked about getting rid of the monument there. He's like, this has been here for, you know, wait, we should have taken rid of this thing years ago. Yeah. Like, well, you were mayor years ago, Paul Soglin. <laughs> well, that's what voters are going to have to decide, too, is you've got somebody who has – Eons of experience. Literally eons of experience. <laughs> but not literally, but literally. <laughs> and then you, you basically have a fresh face, different generation of leadership. It's a lot of policy, like wonky policy knowledge. And who's much more pleasant? Much more pleasant. <laughs> to just talk to and have a conversation with. Doesn't lecture as much. On the other hand, she also is probably further left. He's a little more mainstream Madison, which is still far to the left, He's but not far, as far as she is. I mean, people are going to try and frame this as left and right in some cases. And Paul Soglin is a solid progressive. In any other city across America, he would be to the far left of any candidate running for mayor. People can say, oh, well, Soglin, that's the past. Uh, we want to go into the future. On the other hand, he said which I thought was interesting, by electing Satya Rhodes Conway, we'd be going back to when she was on the city council. And the first name he brings up, Brenda Conkle. Brenda Conkle. We'd go back to the Brenda Conkle days with Satya Rhodes Conway and Dave Chislevich when they were pushing 
inclusionary zoning, which is this complicated big government housing thing where they were upsetting the business community, creating controversy, and not getting much done. Yeah. And, of course, Brenda Conkle originally thought about running in this race and then dropped out. She is probably the poster woman of that era in terms of the progressive Dane battling the business community. There's only so many people who build housing. If you can't find a way of working with them without attacking them and getting them to do affordable housing, look what happened in the Brenda Conkle, Dave Cheslevich, Satya Rhodes-Conway era of inclusionary zoning. Great concept. It can work if you do it on a countywide basis, but you can't do it in a city like Madison because of the zoning laws and because of the state laws. He's saying we're going to go back to that. I'm a pro-growth mayor who has been good for everybody, including people of color and everybody else. Yeah, and, and he th- cites statistics. And he would argue that, you know, you know, being pro-growth that means that more people have access to jobs and and more income you know and that and that and that leads to better outcomes for everyone i mean madison has its economy has been doing well and though there are lots of disparities he points to some numbers showing that those disparities are closing you had said something nice about your opponent prior to you deciding to run again so are we you had at least said i think she was qualified. let's talk about the issues well, I'm just wondering if, are let's we okay t- with talk, either candidate or? Let's talk about the issues. I think what will come out mm-hmm. is uh, why I think I'm a far better candidate and there's no comparison. Well, let's talk about that then. Why are you the better candidate? Well, if we look at the situation nationally on a range of issues from housing to health to social and racial racial justice. We look at where Madison was in 2011, and we look at the latest data we've got, which is mostly 2017. I have really moved this community forward. It's been an exceptional experience. Um, Brookings Institute, out of the 100 largest metro city areas, we are one of 11 that not only has had economic gain, but it has been equitable. If you look at the race to equity data, Uh 2011, Satya had been in the city council for four years. In those four years from 2007 to 2011, except for the Great Depression, it was probably the worst period in the history of this city for African Americans. By the time we get to 2011, economic median uh, median income is lower for African Americans than the census after I left office in the 90s, the 2000 census. 2011, two thirds of African-American children were in poverty, in households in poverty. There's two different data figures on unemployment. One is the one that Race to Equity Report used. It appears that the Census Bureau and its American Community Survey updated the number. So it was either 25.2 or 26.6 percent. But in any case, it was higher than the nation. It was higher than the rest of the state of Wisconsin. The latest data we have is 2017. What do we know? We know that African-American unemployment is under 7%. It's lower than the rest of the state and it's lower than the rest of the nation. We know that there are now only one third of the African-American children in households below the poverty level, not two thirds. We know that African-American household income is up by close to $12,000. Have we closed the disparity gaps? No. But we have done far better a job 
than the rest of the state and the rest of the nation. I did it. She was there for the four critical years, and the city did not address this issue. When he points back to Satya Rhodes Conway and what was going on when she was in the city council. We were in the depths of the Great Recession. (laughs) Yeah. And he comes in after that when the economy's in recovery. So I don't think it's, you know, just him. No, it's not. It's And there's other, there's always more, you know, mayors don't have blevers that say economy go well, economy go badly for these demographic groups. You know, that's yeah. not how it works, you know. But, uh, and I think one of the problems, he, he cited a lot of statistics. He talked about how, you know, uh, African-American childhood poverty has gone from two-thirds under the, the Cheslovich administration to one-third now. You know, and that's a you know that's that's the time where you're you're talking about how there's um, a massive uh, growth in the economy in general. Some of why the indicators have gone up has just been the economy's increasing, right? What indicators? Poverty. Um, no. If that was the case, it would have happened all around the state and the rest of the country. No, absolutely not. We did something different here. We had better leadership, better management. If we were worse off than the rest of the state and the country in 2011 and we're better off in 2017, something different happened here. Paul Slogan is going to argue that it's gotten better for the last eight years under my control. And Satya is saying that it's the worst it's ever been in the history of Madison. (laughs) Uh, I will say uh, what's really interesting about this is that I, you know, my initial thought was going to be that, you know, Satya is going to be focusing more on racial equity than Soglin is. But he spent the first 45 minutes of our meeting talking about what he's been doing for racial equity in this city. It felt like 45 minutes, but it was probably 20. Maybe it was 10. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, he can point to a lot of things. I think he he does a nice job uh, from a political standpoint of citing issues that she's talked about and saying, look, I did that. Some people just aren't ready for it. They talk a good game, but they're not ready to perform. I'm I'm regretful that it's created people who are upset with me, but I make no apologies for the results. I got results in the last eight years that are virtually unmatched in this country. And the lives of Madisonians are better off for it. He clearly is not trying to be someone other than himself. He has the reputation of being grumpy, which... Yes. Certainly, he was grumpy. Se- to, he was grumpy today. Well deserved, but he also takes ownership of that and said, "This is why I'm a good leader because I will go and tell people what I think and what needs to happen." It's a competition. We did better, and I did it, and we didn't even get through the rest of the list of everything we've done. You talk a lot about I. She, you you did you need help from other people, right? You need to collaborate some. For eight years now, I've talked about and given the credit to everyone else. But now, after five months of being attacked by all these candidates and everybody saying they should do better, I am now changing the conversation to I. Yes, when it was time to implement the affordable housing program and policies, the staff did it. When it was time to develop the bus rapid transit plan and to go out there and look at the design for the routes and and how the system would work, the staff did it. There's no question about it. But I'm the one who provided the leadership. And in this day where we're vying for who's more innovative, I want to make it very clear that when you compare Sadia's work at the Mayor's Innovation Project and what we did in the city of Madison, we were ahead. And when it came time to seeing these economic gains compared to the state, compared to the nation, I was there. Certainly, if we'd fallen further behind, I would have been blamed for it. Why is it so difficult to recognize 
that everything we hear in the private sector is true in the public sector. You need quality, dynamic leadership. It starts at the top. It's, it's hard to, to uh, like and want to endorse a candidate when every time you ask a question, he looks at you like, what a stupid question to ask me. <laughs> oh, I really got to go into this now? And then he lectures you for, for 45 <laughs> minutes about the stupid question you asked him. Because you don't even understand anything about what's going on in the city, not like me, because I've been here for forever. Yeah. Yeah, there is. Now, he didn't come out and say, I alone can fix this. But it was close. As a certain person in the White House has. But it was close, and I alone have fixed this. Yeah. I mean, he and, – and when I asked him about that, he basically said, well, I'm, I've transitioned into the me mode because of all these candidates in the primary – Saying they are going to do all these things and I've already done it, or or them attacking me. Well, he did. So you did ask him about that, and and, and he said I've transferred to talking about me. But when he's all saying I used to give people all the credit, he was talking about his own staff in the mayor's office. Yeah, he wasn't talking about collaborating with the county board or Parisi or the, or the city, city council. council. Yeah, I mean he's you know what he's talking about is. He's concerned about what his power is in the mayor's office, not working with any of the government entities to yeah. collaboratively work to, to get stuff done. And I think that one of the reasons the homelessness problem has gotten so bad over the years in Madison is because Paul Soglin and Joe Parisi can't work together on this issue that requires both people to, 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 to work. You know, we, had, we asked him about cops in schools, and he said, flat out, I want the cops in the schools. I believe we should have officers in the schools. If the district doesn't want it, that is their decision. We simply need to know because we have to make our staffing assignments within a budget. Now, I want to point something out about some of the buzz on this issue. Another change that's occurred since I've been mayor is, I think it's close to, we're arresting about a third as many kids as we used to. Compared to... 2011. Okay. A significant drop in the number of arrests. Unfortunately... And kids you mean under 18? Yeah. Or 18? Yeah. Or, okay. And so the question is why? And the reason the data has changed is for three reasons. One is our restorative justice program, where the kids are not going into the criminal justice system. That's a restorative justice program that was more or less treated like a hobby when I came into office and has now been institutionalized. And Satya is now saying we ought to have it in the budget. It is. A quarter of a million dollars. Second reason is the officers are doing their part in trying to de-escalate and find alternatives for the kids. And the third reason is the change in school board policy. Somebody has got to recognize that all those arrests and all that so-called school-to-prison pipeline was orchestrated by the Madison School District. That's when it had its zero-tolerance policy. As the owner of the property, if they were insisting that the child be arrested, if there was evidence for it, that's what would happen. Then, in response to community pressure, the school board changed the policy. And that had a significant role in lowering, lowering the number of arrests. I think Soglin is definitely going to be focused more on crime than Satya Rhodes Conway is. He's going to be more, mm -hmm. I mean, he is he is several times identified this group of 70 to 120 juveniles between the ages of 11 and 16 that are are stealing cars and occasionally assaulting people and breaking into homes uh -huh. um, and that's a, that's a concern for him that's a big quality of life life issue in various parts of the city um and, and I think I, I think that's a issue that he he seems to have some sort of he, he's acknowledging it's a problem mm -hmm. and he's talking about it as a problem. I'm not sure Satya, you know, really thinks about it as a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and and I don't necessarily trust her to want to address it in any 
significant way besides restorative circles of, of, of hugging to, uh, to work these issues out. And as Sagan describes it, these kids are, are unreachable by, the, by, the, by all the city services. You know, these are kids where you try and get them involved in an after-school program, and, uh, and they laugh at you and, 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 and mock you. He's kind of belittling to Sati Rhodes Conway in terms of some of the things she says, saying she doesn't understand things. Um, and, but then you got just the style of, you know, if you choose style, you got to go with Satya in terms of just a personality. Who do you like? Well, if I, this is about likability, you go with Satya. If it's about experience, you definitely go with Soglin. Yeah, I mean, I think if if the same Paul Soglin that was in our meeting today is the guy who's at the forums and on the campaign trail, I think he's going to have a hard time getting re- getting reelected. I think that that is very his his gruffness, his egocentricness, mm-hmm. his belittling belittling of a female candidate who is mm-hmm. also uh, gay. You know, I mean, I, I think that's not going to play well uh, with lots of people in Madison. And despite the fact that he might have better ideas and might have and and, and definitely has better experience, you know, he could end up losing this election if he decides that I need to be an attack dog to get my point across. When we kind of brought up the issue of personality, yeah, uh, he said, "Well, we're going to have we're going to be rolling out this marketing campaign, and I'm not going to tell you about it." Well, if it's anything like his ad was in the primary, it's positive. Look at the great things I'm doing. I'm at the grocery store that we got opened in the neighborhood that didn't have one. If he's got more money, which he probably will, we'll see. And we'll see. He can soften his image somewhat with with ads. And yeah. he can point, you know, he's been mayor a long time. He can point to a lot of things that have happened while he's been mayor. Yeah. Regardless of it, if it's all his doing or not. I don't, I, I've always said that Paul Soggins a really lousy cheerleader for Madison. Madison's this pretty incredible city in the, in the Midwest, you know, that doesn't have a whole lot of success stories over the last 20 years. And Madison's done it. It's a great place to live for most people. Mm-hmm. It is, uh, we have a thriving economy. We have a thriving public sector, private sector thing. Um, you, know, you know, very few cities does what Madison can do. And Paul Soglin doesn't do a very good job of telling our story to the world. No, he's not a good cheerleader, but he is a good defender. So when people don't like Madison, when they want to criticize Madison, he'll take them on. And people do like that. The sharpest disagreement may have come at the end. I asked uh, the mayor about really the most controversial issue of the week, which was maybe the century, Scott. Yeah, maybe the century. Which was the University of Wisconsin considering taking down the uh, Nails Tales sculpture in front of Camp Randall, which is that tall kind of phallic football statue. Football corn cob. Yeah. Uh, final question: uh, Nails Tales. Okay. Yes or no? <laughs> I hated it the moment it was. <laughs> I, I hated it the moment it was put up. And as I've said to other people, I have visions of somebody in a very powerful pickup truck with a large chain (laughs) backing into it in the middle of the night, putting the chain around it, uh, the base, and then accelerating it about 30 to 50 miles an hour and solving that problem. But in 20 years, (laughs) isn't it like a historic thing that makes Madison weird and quirky? I mean, I live, I live like a two blocks from it. I think it's kind of, I mean, it's, weird. it's hideous, but it's, but it's weird. I mean, it's weird, weird, fun? weird and fun. Austin's weird. <laughs> Madison's not weird. No, we're we're surrounded by real. If that thing ever gets pulled over by a pickup truck, we don't know who it is. <laughs> it sounds like a job for Dwight Schrute. <laughs> well, yeah, Sachi's got a pickup truck. Oh yeah. Well, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. Good luck. Me. You bet. Thank you. Hopefully luck will have nothing to do with it. Thanks, guys. So it's good seeing you guys. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Find and follow Center Stage on Google Play, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and in all fine stores. All of the music on Center Stage is by Tube Tester. To listen to past episodes, go to go.madison.com slash Center Stage.